The, the gist of the talk is a, about energy and social transformation. But of course, we're constrained by climate change and the effect of climate change. And I'm starting, my starting point is essentially, uh, I start off from where, uh, from where Julia just uh, uh, showed you the effects at the beginning of her talk. May I? Yeah. No pointer? Yes. Uh, the relation between these two is the heart of my, of my talk. We'll first go through some, some basics. And in this part, don't hesitate to interrupt if something is not clear. I'm not going to be very technical, but there may be questions. And this is the essential part, the question of sustainability. Can we do changes that are both adapting and confronting climate change? Adapting to and confronting at the same time. And as an example, I'll take the nuclear, uh, the problem of nuclear energy, uh, which is a very uh, spectacular case of uh, what is known as technical lock-in. How many of you know about technical lock-in? Has anybody heard about it already? Yes, you have? Good. So we'll come back to that. Just go through quickly. Th through some of these points. The idea, of course, as you know, is uh, we had a situation of stable climate. And we have created a situation in which we've unbalanced the, uh, the stability of the uh, climate uh, the climate, the effect of climate on, uh, on the Earth. The Earth today is a ball that absorbs energy, mostly through the ocean, 90% through the ocean, and uh, a little bit in the atmosphere, a bit more on ice. You've all seen pictures of the uh, melting ice in uh, Antarctica and Antarctica, and a little bit on land. So we're in a situation of instability. We had a system that was relatively stable, and we are now in a system of instability. We've been in that instability, and it's been in, merci. it's been increasing for about 150 years. Basically, the Industrial Revolution. This. Uh, this effect is not quite an exponential, but it resembles an exponential. So it was very slow in the beginning, and nobody noticed it for a while, in spite of the fact that several physicists between 1890 uh, or so and uh, 1970 were quite aware of it. Uh, the majority of the population was uh, ignored the fact. And now we have a system that is on the real slope. The CO2 emissions are rising. The ocean is heating. Acidity of the ocean changes, which changes marine life. And marine life, of course, has an effect on the rest of us. Ice melts, and so on. Now here's the heart of the, my point and the heart of your responsibility. Your responsibility. For us, it's too late. It's happening now. Which you see, I'm, I'm taking a picture that resembles very much the one that uh, Julia showed you. But the, uh, the uh, ordinates are a little bit different. This is time. This is the year 2000. 
This is about the year 2050. This is the temperature, the average temperature rise of the planet, average temperature over the entire planet. And what you see here is that as we pump in CO2 in the atmosphere, if we stopped at 350 ppm, which was the case when we were around the year 2000, it would saturate like that and it would saturate at about the rate at which we stopped. As we keep increasing and we are now here, you see that the earth cannot absorb it all at once. It captures it and it keeps increasing. So the final temperature, if we stop there, would be already two and a half degrees. If we continue pumping <coughs> in CO2 at the same rate, we will reach temperatures at which some, some life will be possible, but it's not very obvious that our life will be possible and what is certain is that we, the survivors will have completely different conditions that we can't even imagine. All this happens at the present pumping rate of CO2. <coughs> All this happens between now and 2050. That's why I say it's your problem. It's not that we have no responsibility, of course. It's not that we don't do anything. You heard it from Julia. You're hearing it from uh, quite a number of us. We're trying to face the problem, but the problem is very, very difficult. So what I've been talking about so far is physical forcing, climate, global climate, and so forth. An effect of this heating is instability and turbulence. I recommend that you remember that because what they, uh, what they mean is that local effects are not identical to global effects. When you give an average temperature of the, of the Earth, you're not telling anything about the, uh, the hurricanes in the Caribbean and so forth. And these tur local turbulence increase as the average temperature increases because you're changing the temperature of the ocean and the ocean has currents and the currents induce turbulence which affects the atmosphere and the clouds and the rain and the wind and so forth. When, ice, when the ice melts, coastlines change. When the uh, permafrost melts, things co come out. And what comes out is not just uh, mammoth bones. It's also the viruses that were there a few million years ago and so forth. Okay, I don't think I have to convince you that there will be major changes. And my point is major changes will occur in all living groups, but it means that we're going to face during that period now, you know that it started already, population redistribution, uh, migrations, the changes in agriculture and so forth. Uh, Bordeaux will not be a one growing area within uh, 20 odd years. Uh, it may grow wine, but it'll be strange wine. It'll be the, 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 it'll, the wine that we used to import from North Africa, the French colonialists imported it from North Africa. Uh, years ago and it found it very, very heavy. It's going to change. Cities. Half of the world lives in cities. Cities like, say, Nairo Nairo Nairobi, 20 million inhabitants on the ocean, on the ocean, on the coast. Two meters of water. 20 million people have to move. It's not going to happen in one day. It's not like an earthquake. It's going to happen slowly. 
things are going to evolve, they are already. And one of the things that's very both fascinating and, of course, troubling for you is to follow what's going on now already that is quite apparent but not spectacular. And there are people in the world, we've heard about that from Julia, there are people in the world who don't want to think about it, who don't want others to think about it. So there's a fight going on in that, from that point of view. Urbanism is going to change industry. Industry has several questions. It's what sort of industry do we need in a world where things are changing at a rate that has never been seen in history, which is what I was showing. Things are going to change very fast. What sort of industry do we need? Can we still live with essentially heavy industries, big systems that are hard to move and so forth? Or do we need something that's much lighter? How light? Can we do without heavy industry? Of course not. There are some, some areas in which we're going to need it. Where and when? That is going to change. It is, in fact, already changing. If you read the, if you read the Financial Times or The Economist, you see that they're aware of that. It's going on. And uh, it, the difference is that it's going on being regulated by the people who own these uh, objects, these industries, and so forth, and who uh, have their own interests, which are not necessarily the interests of the majority of the population, of course. So we're in a situation where conflicts are going to increase. And that, of course, is one, another one of those things that affects human societies. And, of course, trade, transports, globalization, and so forth. I don't have to amplify on that. So we have a system in which you have, on the one hand, energy change that affects planetary change. The fact that the, ch the planet changes, changes human access to resources, all sorts of resources, animal as well as uh, as uh, ground resources. And the system is much more complicated and much more feedback oriented. You have planetary change that determines survival conditions. Societal changes are going to occur to adapt to the planet. It's going to change production, usage, and so forth. And the upshot is Energy is an instrument or a tool of society. And to what extent is it a, a tool that has no personality or does it have a personality? Is it an object that is something that changes continuously because it's human? It's decided by humans. Now, just to sum up, can we get rid of this? No? On peut le baisser un peu quand même? Non? Mais ça, ça fait rien, c'est pas grave. Non, mais c'est pas grave. Ah oui, d'accord. Ok, non. Non, non, remets-le, c'est pas grave. Ok, don't, don't worry. Don't, don't, don't worry, it's ok. How do I go back? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'm on Mac. <laughs> OK, d'accord. Merci. OK, this is just for your notes, uh, just to tell you where the, uh, where the emissions come from, the proportion. 
note that this half of this, a little bit more than half actually, is cows. There's significant emission related to the production of energy. That's mostly fossil fuels. Industry, electricity, electricity production and heat production is 25% because of the fossil fuels. So all that is related to that. Okay, so what I'm saying is there's a social structure that determines, of course, energy use, the rhythm of energy use, the distribution, the intensity, the total energy needs, and all these interact. They interact because if you're producing a given type of energy, you're going to have an, it's going to have an effect on the way you use that energy. For example, you develop a society in which you, you have cars, you have a maximum number of cars. That gives you a technical lock-in. I think the expression is clear in that, in that sense. You have a technical lock-in, which is that a society that needs cars needs the, uh, the uh, petrol that goes in the car. And so you're going to continue using it. And then there's another feedback, which is a global effect. The available energy use, the total energy use that's available, is going to impact society. It's going to create things, as I mentioned, cars, a technical lock-in mm -hmm. on one hand, but it also can give you a freedom. For example, uh, the sun pumps, offers the earth one kilowatt per square meter. If we were able to use even a small fraction of that in a, in a significant way, and it's happening now, then we have a freedom that we don't have if we're dependent on oil in the ground or fracking or, or, or nuclear energy. Okay, so this is what I said before, and this is what I'm introducing now, is we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, how do we do that? How do we regulate it? At what speed can we do it? This is essentially what uh, Julie was talking about. Can we attenuate the changes that are going to affect all living groups, not just humans, but non-humans as well, including vegetables and trees and so forth? which are all dependent on each other. So remember, feedback, feedback, feedback. Can we find a just <coughs> transition? Can we do it right? What you don't see here, this, this is sustainability. Can we do it in a way that People can live through it, people and nature. The transition will occur. That's the curve I showed you. We have those, we had those 50 years, we have 25 left. It's going to, to be a transition. It's going to be a sharp transition. It's never been so fast. How can we preserve livable conditions? The problem is both material and subjective, including race and, and uh, gender. And I didn't write that down to be woke. I wrote that because it is a real problem. And I could have added, in fact, that it was still affected by the colonial period. So it also includes those effects. I don't have time to go into that, but I leave that to you, and I'm sure that uh, you'll find a lot of literature on the, uh, on the topic. 
which is very important because the, the, the problem, we have, we have to find a way of adapting that convinces people. It's not just a matter, it's not top down. Top down in a situation like this is meaningless. Bottom up is meaningless too because we have to work both ways. We have to find collective solutions. We don't have time to do individual experiments here and there. We should do individual experiments, but we have to be able to translate those individual experiments or collective, small collective experiments into large changes that are guided by an instrument which is basically the state, various forms of state and so forth, with a new form of democracy. And the democracy runs through the whole problem. No surprise, inequality. Julia talked about that as well. And of course, it's, it's, a, crucial, it's a crucial aspect. Low income populations are the first to be affected. They're the first and they're the most effective. Imagine people who have housing that is mediocre or, or absolutely impossible. How do we change that first in order to allow of a large fraction of the population to stop using uh, greenhouse gases, including wood, and use electricity in amounts that are low enough and so forth, that, that, we can, that we can test to be just the right quantity that's needed for improving living conditions and at the same time, the two go together, improve li living conditions and uh, slow the emission of greenhouse gases or impede the, the emission of greenhouse gases. How do we combine institutions? That's not easy either. Uh, combining institutions and markets, since we have to live with markets for a while, we won't change that from one day to the next, unfortunately. Uh, in a way that's compatible with democracy. And I'd like to to point out this thing. Uh, I'm sure you're all very much convinced that AI is fantastic and so forth and you love it and you, you wouldn't leave it for a, uh, for a world because you want to be sure that you have all your photographies and your videos and, and so forth and so on. We're all fans of that, aren't we? And when we are fans of that, what happens is that in 10 years, at the rate it's at which it's increasing, 30% of the world's energy, the world's total energy, will be in data centers. It's crazy. So of course, you're fighting thermal isolation of a majority of poor people, poorer people, against the creation of data centers for the rich. Inequality is almost a caricature at this point. What does it look like? This is people basically who have access to electricity in, uh, when you consider these, uh, these countries. It's, whether it's renewable or not doesn't really make much difference. There are two billion people here. That's the level of development uh, and that is ours here in countries like this one. Inequality is there. Another way to look at it is this is the cumulative population taken by uh, deciles, 10%, 10%, 10%, so forth. And this is the cumulative uh, share of wealth. What you see is but this, there's even negative wealth. The majority, this is about the medium, median wealth. 
the majority is below. This is the emissions per capita. It's the same, basically the same curve, except that here it's the, it's the emissions. And what you see is the richer you are, the more you emit. And take the US, for example. The US is 14 tons per person, 14 tons of CO2. It's 1,000 times more than what you find in the islands of the Pacific. That's inequality. And there are fights. This is a map, uh, a recent one, February, of the places in France. You, you recognize the French coast here. This is France. Mm -hmm in which people are fighting against inequality with a climate change tonality because they're, they're fighting against cementing uh, a new, a new uh, mega highway or cementing a new, a new place to, uh, to, to build, for example, uh, an Amazon uh, distribution center, things like that. So these are the areas in which they're fighting. And here it is, is this trouble. So we send the police. We send the army when we have to. When people are fighting for, uh, for some, uh, when they refuse, for example, uh, these uh, these lakes, artificial lakes that are built on, uh, built on, uh, on hills to retain water. It's the most stupid way to retain water in the world because, of course, the water evaporates in the, in, in the summer sun, uh, even in the winter sun, actually. Uh, the, uh, the state sends its soldiers and fights against people. It's a caricature. We're back in the Middle Ages. And we have these resonances. That's why I said the problem is material, but it's also subjective. We have these resonances between effects that are related to eco strict economy, present day economy, so forth, and history. Human history plays a role in every movement of this change. Of this climate change, of the, of the answer, our answer to climate change, I mean. A few words on a case of uh, technical lock-in, which is fairly spectacular, I think. Just to, to remind you, nuclear energy is 2% of the total energy production in the world. It's 10% of electricity production. There are 443 reactors. They're mostly what is called light water reactors, uh, or pressurized water reactors. Uh, it's a technique that uh, we can come back to if you have questions on that. But just remember there's one technology that has become the technology of the majority of the reactors. But it's not the whole story of nuclear energy because you have to put something in the reactor to make it work. You need fuel. And the fuel cycle is at least as important as the reactor. In France, it's a large proportion of the total energy production. It's 70% of the electricity production. So France is a special case. But if you look at what happened in the world, you had a development of nuclear energy until the 70s and early 80s, and then a drop, which is not only related and perhaps not even mainly related to uh, accidents. Three Mile Island, for example, in the States. 
It's related to economics. It was just too expensive. And why was it too expensive? Why did it take long to build reactors and so forth? Well, we'll come to that in a minute. But the result is that it is uh, uh, an energy production system that does not produce a large amount. It produces small amounts of CO2. So in France, for example, it's four and a half tons per person, whereas in the States, it's 14 tons per person. The States has nuclear reactors as well. They have 20% of the electricity coming from uh, nuclear reactors, but cars and, uh, and, and uh, travel and trade and so forth in the States is so uh, overwhelmed by, uh, by um, traffic, motor traffic, that uh, it's huge. Just a few words on, on basics, just to remind you. Uh, of course, nuclear reactions, are, uh, nuclear reactors base, are based on the use of fission. The energy is huge. Uh, breaking a nucleus gives you 100 million times more energy in a very small volume, of course, than breaking a chemical bond. Chemical bond is typically a bond in oil. So the energy, the, the density of energy is enormous. It's a density of energy and not a total energy. In a reactor, you have a chain reaction. Everybody's heard of that, I suppose. We can come back to it if you want. And the chain reaction is an exponential process here. You have fission. Fission emits a neutron or two neutrons, rather. At the same time, as you break the nucleus in two, the two neutrons, each of them can fission again. And they, that's the first generation. There's a second generation where the same thing happens. The third or fourth or fifth, you go up to about the 12th generation and you have a million uh, a million atoms, a million nuclei that have fissioned uh, due to the, to the process. So if, if it happens in a metal where the atoms are close to each other, then it's going to happen. Those millions of atoms, millions of millions of atoms, will have fissioned in about a microsecond. That's a bomb. And what you do in a reactor is exactly the same basic physics process, except that you dilute the process so that all efficients don't occur at the same time. So you send out the, the, uh, the neutrons, you distribute the neutron, uh, the neutron distribution is such that it, the interactions are slower in time. And so you, you get out the energy, you try to get out the energy before everything breaks up. In order to operate a nuclear reactor, you need exquisite control because this is an exponential process and the means of control that you have are all linear. For example, what are you going to do? You're going to change the size of the reactors uh, or, or of the space where the neutrons uh, travel in such a way that you uh, reduce their probability of interaction with the nuclei. That's linear. You change, you change space. Uh, you can change the temperature. You can change uh, the pressure. If, uh, if this occurs in, uh, in a pressurized water reactor, for example, you can change the energy or the density. All these effects are linear, and you're trying to control an exponential process. Overall, it works. It works because very clever people have designed these machines very good people, very competent people operate these machines, and that is absolutely vital, crucial. These people are trained 
to operate a reactor in conditions where they're always watching to see whether it's not that exponential is not starting somewhere in the reactor. And so the competence of the people, the number of the people, the quality of the people is absolutely crucial. And the reason why we haven't seen more accidents is essentially related not to a fantastic technology that was designed in a, by a, uh, people in a special place and so forth, but by the fact that good people were trained, and many of them, in such a way that they make these things work. And even when potential accidents start, initiate, they know how to bring the machine back to equilibrium. A little bit of history. Nuclear energy had a troubled birth, as you know. That's, uh, that's the bomb, the Manhattan Project. What I just want to note is that all, there were many power reactor uh, concepts. There's not just the uh, light water reactor. There are many others. Somebody, one of the founders said, there are about a thousand possibilities. Among those, 19 different reactors, completely different concepts, very different from the ones that we know today, were developed, operated, and worked. They worked because the people who were working them were very competent and knew how to react and, uh, and so forth. So they were studying these things. They were studying. They were not deciding that we're going to build an industry on it. They were studying the problem. And there was a committee that uh, Oppenheimer was a chief of that discussed, that was asked to discuss the feasibility and the acceptability of nuclear energy, of nuclear power. Can we have uh, a system built on nuclear power? And they said, we're going to need another 15 to 20 years of pure research, pure technological research. There's no basic science to reinvent, it's, it's known. But technology, for the reason I just gave, exponential versus linear, is very tricky. And we need 15 or 20 years of experimenting to find out whether it's possible and whether it's safe. And whether the radioactivity it can be controlled or eliminated would be wonderful, but no, it can't. Uh, and, w and what do we do with the re residues once the reactor is stopped? We need another 20 years. And a few years later, <coughs> at the same time, uh, the, the uh, US Navy decided it needed a nuclear submarine a nuclear submarine is interesting, especially if, it, uh, if it's a light water reactor, because it uses water, and the Navy knows things about water. And uh, the, uh, so they, they said, we, we want a reactor because we can keep our submarines under the water for six months. We don't have to go up and let people breathe and refuel. We don't have to refuel. And, and the, uh, the oxygen can be recycled by the, the motor of the submarine, a nuclear motor. So they designed a, a, a nuclear motor, a motor, not something that produces electrons, a motor that just turns a propeller. They built a motor in 1950, started in 1951, and it worked uh, about six years later. But in the meantime, there was a Cold War going on. And in 1953, Eisenhower, who was president of the United States, uh, gave a speech at the UN where he said, we are offering atoms to the world. We had developed the Manhattan Project, the bomb, and so forth. We have all sorts of wonderful secrets, and we will just release them to the world and give them to the world. And not only will we give the secrets, they didn't give them all, of course. Uh, we will also offer reactors. We will offer reactors for research, 
That was a good idea. And we will offer power reactors. And electricity will end up being f practically free. It was paradise. The problem was that nobody was prepared. There was no power <coughs> reactor. There was none, not one, that was working, that was capable of producing electrons. So what did they do? Uh, determined by political considerations and absolutely not economic, not scientific, certainly not. And uh, it was a political decision. You must have that reactor working, and we must be able to send out reactors so that we will get our hands on the market when the market develops. We'll be there first. And of course, there's the political, uh, uh, the political value of offering uh, a new type of energy to, uh, to other countries. So what did they do? They took the motor of the submarine. They combined it with the core of a nuclear reactor that was being tested to be built for some airplane stuff. They put the things together. And they made a model of a nuclear reactor that is a light water reactor, the first working light water reactor that ended up feeding electricity to a part of a Pittsburgh, a city in the, in the east of the US. And this first thing was the model of all the reactors working today in the world. And nothing has changed in 70 years. So when people tell you that this is a new technology, remember that. It's 70 years old. And it was not designed for the purpose. It was initially designed as a motor on which we add a, a core from an airplane and put these things together and have a turbine and, and we make it work. And then we copy it. We know how to do it because we've done it once. So we, we make more. And who do we sell the first half sell, half offer, the first uh, nuclear reactors to a foreign country when, from the States? Japan. Japan, because Japan had, had the bomb, so Japan would also have electricity. It's politics. Just to remind you what a nuclear reactor looks, at, looks like, it's not a simple system. The reactor vessel, this is the most sensitive part, of course, is here. You have control rods and so forth. You have, you make pressure, you heat it. It's basically a locomotive. It's, you're heating water under conditions that are not that fantastic. And the motor, the, the, the pressure runs a turbine, a generator, and the electricity comes out. It's quite large. This is a truck, OK? These are not small objects. When people tell you that the first thing we have to do now, for example, in France, is to build a series of huge nuclear reactors and a, a whole family of small ones that have all sorts of virtues, remember that. Then there's the other part, not the reactor, but the rest. Where does the fuel come from and where does it go? It comes from the mine. You have conversion. You, en you have to enrich it because, as you know, or you probably heard, there's, uh, the, the, the f fission occurs in uranium-235, the isotope-235, and not the isotope-238. So isotope-238 is 99.3% of the uranium. 
So that very small fraction, residual fraction, the 0.7%, that is uranium-235, you have to increase it to 4 or 5%. That means that you have to enrich it with a big bunch of factories that, are, that cost money and that are not in the price of the reactor when you sell it. The enriched uranium goes into fuel, the reactor. The reactor, once the fuel has been expended, it goes into a pool because it's hugely radioactive and you have to leave it for three or four years in a, in a pool to let it uh, cool down so that you can do uh, mechanized operations to, uh, to treat it and to store or dispose somehow. Disposal means that you don't know what you're doing with it, right? Uh, find some disposal for the thing. That is the usual system. And then come on. Yeah. This is the French system. This is what makes France a nuclear, a special nuclear country. France, Russia, not the US, France, Russia, and to a small extent, Japan. Japan has been trying to do it, but it doesn't work. So it's basically France and Russia have this system. You have the system I showed you before. And here, once you take the spent, spent fuel, you have a good idea. You say, let's run it through the horse again. We'll take the uranium that comes out. It's depleted in uranium-235, but it has a lot of uranium-238. It has essentially nothing but uranium-238. We'll irradiate that with neutrons, not the same energy, but that's not too important now. Uh, we'll irradiate that with neutrons in a reactor. The uranium-238 will go through a series of reactions and become plutonium-239. Plutonium is feasible, fissible, and it fissions more easily than uranium-235. So we're making something, we're basically making energy out of nothing, out of, out of something that was initially useless. Isn't that wonderful? We're playing with people's magic feelings. The result is that actually this process is essential to make bombs, the chemistry, the chemistry that goes in, not, not the process itself to, to, to make fuel, but the enrichment process and the, the production of plutonium is essential to make bombs. People who develop that are people, if we're back in the 50s, 60s, when the US did the same thing, the essential use of that was to make bombs. And the use of that today is let us validate, take advantage of the fact that we have these factories to make this, uh, this possibility and turn it into a commercial, something of commercial interest. That is a dream that doesn't work that has been shown not to work, but which France is, and Russia are pursuing. Is it worthwhile economically? This is the, the way the price of nuclear, uh, nuclear technology has increased. It continually increases. The more you make them, the more they cost and the longer they take. No valid industrial process goes that in that direction. A valid industrial process, for example, would be this. This is solar. 
it started out very high because th there was all the uh, science to, to develop and the technology, the initial technology, building, including building ovens to, uh, to uh, refine the silicon. And you see the price go down here. The price has fallen by 90%, and actually it's more than 90% since uh, the, the beginning. Yes? What drives the cost increase? Is it what drives the cost increase? Is it that uranium recovery is more expensive, or which part gets more expensive? If you're talking about uh, nuclear, what drives the cost is the uh, first the time it takes to be sure that the reactor you're building, every reactor, that's the, the main, the, the nutshell is, is there. Every reactor is a special case. Why? Because of feedback. Because when you change the neutron distribution by introducing uh, uh, an absorbent, in order to control the, uh, the neutron intensity. You, you introduce uh, a rod of boron that absorbs neutrons, you're changing the neutron distribution. You change the neutron distribution, you change the fission probability. If you change the fission probability, you have to redistribute the, uh, the uh, initial uh, pieces of uranium that the uh, neutrons go into and so forth. So you're changing the geometry of the reactor. Not hugely, by small amounts, but because it's an exponential process, you have to be very careful. It takes time. And if it takes time, and if you have to change the, 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 the nature of the absorbance and the, uh, <coughs> and the material that you put in the reactor, you're rebuilding locally, bit by bit, the reactor. So it takes 10 years instead of taking five or taking three. The exception, one of the exceptions, essentially the, the best exception, was uh, when the, the, the French were building the series of reactors in the 70s. Because they, they were building them one by one, but uh, they were building them one by one at the same time, if I may say. Because while they, they had a population of workers for all the various uh, areas, technical areas that were involved, and they would take them from one place to another to, to build a new reactor. And these people were very competent because they'd been building these reactors. They could go fast. They could copy directly from one reactor to the next and change while they were building one reactor and the other one had started to, uh, had advanced, say, they could immediately take the, uh, the, uh, the advantages that they'd found, the new changes that they'd made from one to the other, and it went much faster. So the average time for building a reactor at that time was about five years, five to six years. But when you build one reactor starting from scratch, it's been shown to be, experimentally shown, to be between 10 and 12 or 13, and perhaps in the case of EPR in Flamanville, uh, 20 years. In the case of solar, it's uh, quite different. The, the advantage of, uh, of solar, it's true to some extent for, for, <coughs> wind, for um, the uh, windmills, uh, but solar is very spectacular from that point of view. A solar cell is a, a, about this size. And all you do is connect these once you've made them. And these are pieces of silicon that you have to refine and so forth. It's, it's not that trivial, but it's a very basic uh, well-defined technology that is always identical to itself. It keeps on, you just make more of it. So you end up with plates and you can make miles of it. You can make roads out of it. So, uh, or cover roads out of it, I mean. 
so the, uh, there's a simplicity there that you, uh, that you ha don't have at all in many other technologies, in, of course, including nuclear technology. So this is just... Can I ask something? S sorry? The percentage of uranium that is currently being reprocessed in uh, in a light water reactor, the percentage is of the order of between three and five percent. And the uh, there's a difference in the case of this is just to show you what is what a pool uh, a cooling pool. I'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, a cooling pool for uh, uh, when you cool them, when you when you get spent fuel and take it out of the reactor, you need to put it in a pool. It's not a small swimming pool. This thing is huge. It costs 1 billion euros to build, and it takes about 10 years to build. <laughs> and it's almost full. We need a second one if we're going to develop nuclear. And it's tricky. I'll come back to this if you want. This is to answer your question. The other thing is uh, small modular reactors, which are being sold today to us sold virtually because they don't exist. There's not one that works. Uh, in 2002, the nuclear people themselves decided that enough was enough. We can't continue with light water reactors because we're depending, these are light water reactors. 1950 technologies based on military applications. They were very clear about that. So we have to build something else. So we're going to build generation four reactors. Generation four is essentially answering Oppenheimer's question. The idea was, when it was proposed in 2002, was we're going to study the problem. We're going to invest large sums of money given mostly by governments in order to study uh, new reactors old reactors, but make them work industrially. For example, uh, there are reactors that were designed and worked for 10 years, actually. A small reactor was built with uh, liquid uh, uh, fuel, liquid fuel. The advantage of a liquid fuel is that uh, you, d you don't have core uh, melting. There's no core. So it's much, intrinsically it should be safer. The problem is that uh, the liquid is a salt, a uranium salt, that is, has fluorine in it and is very corrosive and so forth. So you have to find a system in which you can manage to uh, solve the chemical problem. It's not a physics problem, it's a chemical problem. Things like that have to be studied, and it, it takes years to, to, to study that. The amount of money that was invested in it was not that large, even if it was given in part by people like uh, Steve Jobs and so forth, who were very excited about it and thought they would make a lot of money about it. What they, what they did was draw money from the state, from the US government particularly, and now it's, in, it's true for the French government, putting money in it, small amounts compared to the national budget, but significant amounts for people who work on that to work on it for a while, realize that it's not going to work, and uh, close shop and keep the money. And that's what's going to happen.
It's beginning to happen, in fact, now. Because, the, uh, for example, in France, uh, people have, uh, have been designing on paper. Uh, a nuclear reactor on paper is very easy to make because uh, you take an eraser and you change the, the structure. But if it's a real reactor, it's much more complicated. Uh, the guy who built the first reactor for shipping port for the, uh, the American reactor I was talking about for Pittsburgh, uh, he, he sent a paper saying exactly that to the U.S. Congress in 1953. So it's been known for a while that it's quite different. And uh, but we're, we're reliving the, the, the same thing. And this is the result. Now, I'd like to come back quickly. One, one of the problems we have in France is this. Just to get out of nuclear for a minute. To build a nuclear reactor, you need, and especially if you're going to build several, you need a strong industrial base, very diverse, with people, for example, who know how to solder uh, special pipes that are this big and which ca cannot uh, suffer corrosion and so forth. And uh, so you need an industrial base that is strong. This is the evolution of the French industrial base over the years from 1970 to 2020. And what you see is that it's divided by half. And what you can imagine is that the first people who left industry or who were thrown out of industry were the people who had worked on technologies like nuclear, which were no longer useful because there was no, nucle no, no new nuclear reactor being built in France at the time. All the reactors had been built at the same time. So they're all built at the same time, which has an advantage in terms of the time it takes to build them. And then you stop. And people say, what's going to happen in, in 40 years when these reactors get old? The government didn't want to know. To, to know. The nuclear industry didn't want to know. The electricity uh, consortium had been privatized and was looking at the market, so it didn't want to know either. Nobody took care of it. And we're, it is, uh, we're in a state today where the average age of a reactor in France is 39.3 years old. And in principle, after 40 years, you have to be very careful in using a reactor. So that what the decision was, was that let's prolong them. Let's decide that we're going to leave them, let them work for another 10, maybe 20 years. Who knows what's going to happen? Initially, when they were designed, the idea of the 40 years, I can go into that if you're interested, it's very, there's a very simple reasoning, which is that at some point, the reactor, the reactor is in a, in a so-called pressure vessel. And the pressure vessel is something that you can't move. You build it, and it's there, and it's in the concrete, and you, can, you can't take it out and change it and put in another one. That's impossible. You abandon the reactor, and you build another one, if, if, if that's your if that's your desire or your possibility. Uh, so what's going to happen to that pressure vessel after 40 years? It's completely irradiated at the, uh, at the position of the core. So the, the, this is an alloy. This is a steel alloy. An alloy means that you have certain, a certain mixture of uh, different metals, and they're in a certain order that defines the stability and the strength of the, uh, of the steel. If you irradiate, after 40 years, every single atom in at the uh, position of the core will have changed positions, every one, because the neutrons go into it and bump it, and they go from one place to another, and you change. And since you're, you, go, you cycle the temperature 
from high temperature to low temperature, every time the alloy reorganizes. And it organizes itself in a different way every time. So you don't know what is the state of the reactor after 40 years. So the decision was, we decide that it's 40 years because every atom will have been moved once. And after that, we stop. For submarines, it's 25 years because submarines have people in them, in the water, and you don't want to kill them. For a reactor, we go to 60 years and we don't worry about what's going to happen. Have we tested it? There have been tests, there are tests. The tests are made with small pieces of, of uh, steel that are put in various positions of the reactor. And the assumption is that the piece of steel that's here will have been irradiated and will behave exactly as the rest. Nobody has ever gone to see whether it's true or not, in spite of the fact that some reactors have been taken apart. And it, it could, it's a sort of study that could have been done that has not been done because it costs money. So we have a, we end up with a, a technique that in itself, I mean, the idea of using nuclear energy is a good idea if you stop there. If you build the thing and create conditions where all the, the negative virtues of capitalism come in to economically decide that, no, we, can, we don't have to keep all those competent people. We let, them, we let them go, let the industrial force disappear. And the workers go away. They go to services. What services do they go to? They go to what they call services here are actually people who are servicing apparatus that was built in foreign countries at cheaper prices, whether it's nuclear or non-nuclear. And so the, the, there's, a, there's a multiple lock-in. There's a lock-in that's purely technical, and there's a lock-in of people. And I have no idea of the time. Five minutes. OK. This is to show you the speed at which solar <coughs> is increasing. We have reached a, uh, a point where uh, solar represents right now about 6% of uh, world energy, as opposed to nuclear 2%. So it's growing. It has its problems. One of the problems is uh, the sun doesn't shine at night. We've been told that many, many times and so forth. So we need to find means of storage and so forth. There's been incredible progress in, that, in, the, in the last years. And, and the progress is everywhere. It's been in the storage. It's been in the uh, technology itself and so forth. It keeps growing. And the rate of growth at the moment is judged to continue at the same at the, at the same speed, which means that every uh, the speed of growth is such that in 10 years, continued growth of uh, solar, there will be about six times the uh, energy produced compared to nuclear. To, to existing nuclear. And uh, so there's, and of course, the advantage of solar is that you can scale its use. You can put it on a roof and have an autonomous house or an autonomous, autonomous village or an autonomous, uh, autonomous town. You can also put it in the, uh, in the grid. And if, as long as you have less than about 30%, 30 to 40% of solar intermittent, 
in your, uh, in your grid, you can still use the grid more or less as it is. You have to change it a bit, but reasonably. If you go above, you have to redo it. And people are working, of course, on that. So we had, the perspective is definitely renewables, particularly solar, but w with other, other things taking, uh, ta being intermediates, we have a, a, a situation where renewables can take the, can take the rest, and we do, and, and replace fossil fuels. The problem of replacing fossil fuels, and I'm going to stop here. The problem of replacing fossil fuels is a political problem, an economical problem, a class struggle problem, in a sense an inequality problem, rich countries versus poor countries, rich parts of the country versus poor parts of the same country, and so forth. The heart, of, the core is there. And the only solution that's, uh, that, that one can imagine, detailed solutions are hard to imagine, but basically, I can't read the thing. No, we can't. I can't. Well, this is the basic thing. Finding a way, because energy is in an instrument of society, society has to take that instrument and see how it shares it, how it works it, how it changes it, and how it distributes it, and for whom, and what are the priorities. And you have... 20 or 30 years left to solve the problem. Thank you. What your view is on thorium reactors? I know that you went over like all the small modular reactors like in one go, but uh, I, w I was wondering what your view is as a person with an experience on the topic because I see s some parts that could be like potentially beneficial, especially in the sense that it could also the problem that we have right now with nuclear waste. Like, as far as I understand, we can use uh, some of the nuclear waste that we already have and process them through thorium reactors and therefore reduce the half lifetime of these isotopes. Yeah. Uh, there are actually two different questions. You can, uh, th there's a technology that involves using so-called fast neutron reactors. The, the uh, light water reactors I was talking about are reactors in which neutrons, when they're emitted, they're energetic, fast, and they are slowed down by interaction with, with the water. They bump into water molecules and they're, they, they're slowed down like a billiard ball uh, gets slowed down when you, uh, when you knock on it other balls and uh, so you have slow neutron reactors and fast neutron reactors I didn't talk about the fast neutron reactors their advantage quote and unquote is that they produce plutonium in from uranium 238 in order to to do that you need to have fast neutrons so you need to have fast neutron reactors and fast neutron reactors producing plutonium have, at one point, there's a bunch of plutonium in the reactor. You need a small bunch, about five kilograms, to make a bomb that's better than Hiroshima. So if you have core fusion 
in a fast neutron reactor, you have a bomb, a potential bomb. So the technology is very sensitive. I, I was talking about exponential versus linear. This is worse. So people have overall abandoned. There are some people who still work on it. And there are, especially in France, people dream of reusing this because they want to close the, the fuel cycle. And it's a way to close the fuel cycle. That's one point. The other point is thorium. Yes, if you use uranium-233 instead, uh, instead of uranium-235, you can produce thorium. You can, you can produce fission after there are some nuclear reactions. And then you produce uh, fission from a thorium isotope. Uh, the, uh, the advantage is that you don't produce very long-lived uh, radioactive nuclei. <coughs> very long means it can be a million years. You shorten it considerably. You bring it down to 300 years. 300 years is a long time. It's 10 generations. But it's possible okay. to use the, the nuclear waste that is currently stored in France, right, to use that as, the, as a fuel. So you go from a million years, you don't add any new energy, and you reduce it back to 300 years. You reduce it, and you bring it down from million years of radioactivity to 300 years. That's the positive aspect. That's true. It, it works if you, if you have the appropriate fast neutron reactor. There's a slight problem, though, another problem, besides the fact that you, 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 do, you, you may not be enthusiastic about developing a, a fast neutron reactor for the reasons I mentioned. Uh, there's, another, there's another point, which is that in order to do that on an industrial scale, because that's the only, it doesn't make sense otherwise, it's enormously expensive. Uh, remember that there was an experiment in France, uh, Super Phoenix was built that way, and uh, it was stopped because it worked 8% of what was expected. Uh, so there's a difficulty there. The other problem is that if you, uh, if you build a system like that, you're going to need one fast nuclear reactor devoted to the cycle you're mentioning for every two normal reactors. So you're increasing your nuclear fleet by 30%. You really you have to be hard put to find energy sources to to use a system that's as complicated as that. And remember, this is a huge industry. Uh, I mean, it's a huge industrial project. Remember the sizes. Remember the complexity. Uh, the idea of using nuclear energy is, a, is an old dream. It started in 1912. But there may be other ways. That I agree with for sure. But it's better to go it's, it's not, uh, the idea is not to say the science is bad or, or, or we should throw away uh, uh, knowledge. It's, it's just that it doesn't make sense. In the, in the system in, in reality. Sorry. Thank you. Yes, uh, Sarah from Germany. Um, if the economics speak against building nuclear power plants, plants and also the technological risk speaks against, what is your take on why there are currently still nuclear power plants in construction and why many more are planned? There are, there are two. Uh, Two answers here. Uh, why there are more plans? Well, 
I basically know it. It's just one answer. Uh, in it's a light light water no. <laughs> reaction. In 1956, I think, the, uh, there was a meeting at the uh, United Nations on Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace project. And the Israeli uh, expert on nuclear, the guy who was responsible actually for developing nuclear energy in Israel, uh, came out and said there are no two nuclear energies, military and civilian are the same because of the fuel cycle, basically, including a reactor to it. To it. But basically, it's the fuel cycle. It's the, uh, it's the extraction of plutonium. And, and so forth. You can imagine that uh, many countries are interested in having an access to the knowledge. It doesn't necessarily mean proliferation because experimentally we know that there are nine countries that have uh, developed bombs. There's another country that, that uh, Iran that could be accessing it's just at the limit but basically the knowledge to build a bomb is on the internet if you do it in your kitchen you won't make a good bomb but you'll make a nuclear bomb uh, figuratively and if you want to make something that's top knowledge, then you have to go into the details. And a proportion of those details is the fuel cycle you develop for nuclear, civilian nuclear reactors. So the idea that people are interested in developing is related basically to, to, to that. That's historically verified. Uh, they know that they they get the knowledge to do it and then they decide whether they do it or they don't. There are countries that, that abandoned. Uh, South Africa had built a bomb, possibly exploded it, we're not very sure, but anyway they built one and they decided that they were not going to develop it. This was before, uh, uh, before uh, the disappearance of uh, apartheid and they decided that they were not going to uh, to go into uh, nuclear forces because it's it's too expensive and it may not be the solution to uh, to uh, national power problems in on an international scale and so forth and so on I don't know if I've completely answered your question yes yes Huh? Uh, you mentioned a uh, like okay yes uh, I'm Kushi I'm from India I am Kushi I'm from India yes. and uh, my question was related to how in the beginning you talked about how we need to find let's say a just transition and for that we also need to combine institutions with the market so I wanted to know which institutions in particular should we be targeting how to actually do that and how does that factor into let's say the state economy relations that you just talked about uh, particularly at the beginning of the question slowly uh, how yes how how what you talked about finding yeah, a just I, transition just after that uh, yeah so which institutions should we be focusing upon like when you said that we have to combine institutions with the market yeah. so uh, which institution should we be focusing uh. upon and how should we be doing it, especially given the current context of like, let's say the state economy relations, and we don't have a lot of time anyway. So how do you suggest we go ahead?
the question to you. How can we do it? I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, I don't have an answer. When I look at the institutions we have, uh, in France these days is a caricature of malfunctioning institutions. Uh, when I look at that, you, you feel almost paralyzed. <coughs> the only thing is that we do know, from, including from French history, that at some point there's a, there are breaking points. There are tipping points from the point of view of the climate, but there are breaking points from the point of view of, uh, of society and societal stability. We are in a, an instability. It's true world, worldwide, and it's true country by country. And how we're going to get out of that, I don't know. I don't know. What I, what I can say is that I don't, we can imagine on paper, it's like paper reactors. It's on paper. We can imagine situations in which uh, the market, operation of the market can help an institution or an institution can help operation of the market in conditions where the market is willing to accept that we're going to favor low income people versus high income people. And markets at this point are not exactly in going in that direction. So there is a contradiction. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. If I may also mention, I have a friend which has been, uh, he's now retired, he was he headed the power plants. He was also the one who wrote the fundamental book about security, nuclear security. So we had discussions, quite tough discussions about that. And he was completely sure that we could make very safe nuclear plants and everything. He's an engineer. And at what point he was, I mean, I told him, okay, maybe it's, you're right, but do you think it's still currently the case? Because now we have lots of subcontractors. I mean, neoliberalism into the nuclear era, it's subcontractors, private public partnerships, and it changes things. And he told me, in that case, of course, I mean, now it's not as sure as it was before yeah. because we don't even know who are the subcontractors yeah. and there are cascades of subcontractors. So the institutions also in relation to the market is, uh, is also at the production level. I mean, you, you have plenty of changes between the 60s and now in, in who is producing, who is maintaining, who is, and it, it's probably a major problem. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Thomas from Norway. Um, yeah, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is related to the intermittency problem. That like mm -hmm. uh, intermittency problem, like the or yeah. the, the, the of new uh, of renewable energies when solar and wind can't produce. Uh, you can't basically control the production as uh, of energy as. Uh, Closely as you can with uh, nuclear power or hydropower, uh, for instance. And if you we're going to phase out, like phase out nuclear power, and uh, hydropower, for instance, isn't very scalable. You can't. It, there's a limit to how much, how much you can uh, you can expand it. Um, yeah. How are we going to solve the? How are we going to ensure that basically supply meets demand? Uh, um, at every point in time, like should storage, is that the solution? And how, in that case, um, through technologies that don't exist yet, or through storing water in, in reservoirs, uh, or pumping water up, or mm -hmm. yeah, basically that's because um, mm -hmm. I, I would imagine that nuclear power would be helpful in the, in that in that case as a reserve. Yeah, well energy source I, I, yeah. see, I see what you mean uh, tell, tell me if I if I answer your question yeah the, <clears throat> how, how do things operate in uh, in in fact when when people talk about especially people who oppose 
the development of renewables. There, there are fewer people now than there used to be, but there are still many people, uh, particularly in France, who uh, do everything they can to slow down renewables so that they can tout their nuclear reactors and so forth. What they, what they try to put under the rug is a, a factor of time. It's quite clear that we're not going to get rid of the use of nuclear energy tomorrow. It'll last at least 10 years for many reasons. One of the reasons is that the regular activity is in the reactors. And uh, as long as we check that they are still, that they can still work without uh, creating uh, major problems, then those reactors that are checked and work should be kept to do exactly that. In the meantime, work like hell to uh, adapt the grid to uh, intermittence. That's one thing. And use all, all available technologies, which include pumping water and cycling it and so forth, and uh, developing hydrogen as well. There's a, there's a very interesting situation. I was convinced that the idea of, uh, of using hydrogen was silly because, uh, uh, because it's based on electrolysis. Uh, it requires huge amounts of energy to start with. <coughs> and the, uh, the electrolysis uh, <coughs> problem itself and the, uh, the, uh, the output is, is fairly low. But actually, when you, when you look at it, uh, the process itself is not very complicated. It can be improved, and it is being improved. And uh, it's quite possible that the, the, we're, uh, we're, for hydrogen, we're in a stage where we were for solar about uh, 20 years ago. So there, there, are, there are possibilities. I mean, the immediate possibility is simple. It's keep using nuclear energy because we have it. And, uh, and as long as we're sure that we've put in enough strength and not too many levels of, uh, uh, of subcontracting to, uh, to guarantee that uh, the reactors can still last for another 10 years. I mean, you have to be realist because it's a real problem. Yeah. Hi, thanks for this. Um, I'm Haley from the United States. I was just wondering because we haven't talked a lot about like the geopolitics around nuclear, and I'm wondering if there's a scenario where, you know, like increased isolationism or kind of difficulty in extracting uranium that's needed for nuclear would you know deter France from this trajectory that it's on so I'm just thinking in terms of I think recently Niger like stopped allowing France to extract it's not the biggest provider of uranium but it's one of so is it significant enough to like change that trajectory or is it there are enough you know uranium sources to extract from that it doesn't matter our favorite uh our favorite uh, source today is Kazakhstan. Okay. So there's alternatives. I mean, it's uh, the, the problem in itself is, is not that different from the problem of oil in the in the 1910s, 1920s. It's it's uh, you go where where you get a source and you can commercialize and so forth. Uh, it's very cynical. Uh, whether, whether that, that's, the, that's what's happening. I mean, I'm not mm. saying it's good or bad, mm. it's happening. Uh, whether it's sustainable, uh, no, it's not, obviously. No. I mean, Kazakhstan is not the, the, is not the most stable source it depends a lot. Uh, another thing, 
we, ha we get our uranium largely from Kazakhstan and we get our uh, enriched uranium 30% comes from Rosatom, Russia and it was not affected by mm. the war in Ukraine there was mm -hmm. no uh, blackout and there was no uh, refusal uh, no uh, what do you call it uh, opposition to, uh, mm. to trade and so forth and so on. Mm. Business as usual. Hi, I'm Aurélien from France. I wanted to know what's your take on fusion, basically. <laughs> it's a short question, but I'm sorry. <laughs> It'll be a short answer. You want to put us. You want to put the sun in a bottle. How do you make the bottle? There's a, the the development of, uh, of plasma physics, thanks to the idea of developing fusion, has been fantastic, and that's wonderful from the point of view of science basic science and possibly applications of <coughs> plasma in many in many areas it's a, it's really an interesting uh, area of physics and and of technology using using it the, the uh, in a normal rea in a no in a in a light water reactor uh, the, uh, the most intense neutron flux is about uh, 10 to the power 14 neutrons per second, which leads you to, after 40 years, every atom has been displaced once and so forth. Uh, in a fusion reactor, if uh, the, the neutron density, uh, if there's a flash, and, and, the, and the plasma cracks instead of remaining in the tor in the torus. Uh, if the neutrons go out, it's 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 20. There's no material on Earth that can resist that. So the idea, I mean, the, the, the result has been that uh, in 1950, people said, in another 20 years, we'll have fusion as a, an energy source. In 1970, they said it'll take another 20 years. In 1990, they said it'll take another 20 years. And they still say it'll take at least 20 years and maybe more. Doesn't work. And and you can go a step further. There's, there's, a basic, there's a basic reason. And then there's another, uh, there's another problem, which is, uh, which is true also for standard nuclear. Do we need essentially centralized electricity uh, sources? Do we need to have big reactors here and there? Is it the sort of, do we have an industrial center necessarily next to it, which is the situation today, which is the economy in which we are today? Is the economy in this change that's going to occur and where we're going to need a lot of, uh, a lot of flexibility, is, is that the sort of thing we want to develop? Systems where we have big poles even the capitalists themselves realize that it may not be true because they're trying to sell the SMRs. The SMRs are supposed to be the small reactors that you put here and there. Just You play with them and so forth. It's wonderful. Just forgetting that if you have a, a lattice of small reactors, you're going to have enriched uranium travel from one place to the other. And you'll have an economy that will have to be based on the, the motions of, uh, of, of, the, uh, 
uh, of radioactive uh, material, material mm -hmm. which has to be protected and so forth, and and, and all the trimmings, the, the the stately trimmings of policing and surveillance and uh, and safety uh, guards and things like that that uh, that go with it. Is that the sort of thing we want in in the period where we're trying to adapt to climate change and find flexible solutions and so forth and so on? Besides the fact that we don't want, not everybody wants to have a policeman next to the door. Uh, my name is Esula and I am from Kazakhstan. So I want to ask about, yes, uh, nuclear plants would be a solution for sustainability, but we touched upon inequality and equality. I'm quite interested. Right now the solution could be like sustainable and maybe right for the climate change and what is happening right now when it comes to ecological side, but what it comes to inequality, I want to know your idea because for instance in Kazakhstan itself, itself right now we are providing like mainly 40 percent of all uranium and it has like extraction and everything has ecological consequences that are affecting that part of area like country and also it will take like just 20 years just deploy all uranium that we have in the country and I feel like all the developed countries would be able to right now develop all these plants and employed in their own countries. Meanwhile, developing countries would stay behind as usual. So what do you think about inequality that involves in this kind of technologies right now? Well, that, that's why I showed the, uh, the slide on, on inequality in the world. Uh, I, two things. One thing you have to realize that countries that say we want to develop nuclear, even countries that start to pour uh, concrete to put a, a nuclear plant on, even when they've reached that position, and sometimes even when they've started building, <coughs> very often they abandon. And in fact, the majority of the countries who, after 1980, uh, decided to apply to, to building, asked for contracts to, to build nuclear plants, uh, they abandoned. Uh, and uh, the reason why they abandoned was that uh, they realized when they really faced the thing and when they got out of the myths uh, that they didn't have the strength to do it. They didn't have the people. So they, the, the, uh, the, the caricature is what uh, Rosatom is doing now. Uh, Rosatom offers, and it's doing that in Africa particularly, it, it offers a country, uh, I think uh, there are five or, five or six countries that have been offered that, including the recent, uh, recent countries like uh, Niger or, uh, or uh, Burkina Faso, and countries that, countries that are not at the top of uh, richness and who, who dream that they're going to leap up with that, Rosatom offers them uh, to build the reactor, to run the reactor, to take the reactor back when it's finished, and the country will just have the money and the electrons. That's colonialism. And uh, the, uh, for one, it's colonialism. And two, I don't think it's realistic. Because you can't, you can't run a country. You can't ask the, uh, the, the Russian population has other problems. And you can't ask r Russian people come over, run your reactor, live in an African country for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40 years and run the reactor. It doesn't make sense. In, in the world where we're, going, where we're going now, 
with the changes that are already happening, it doesn't work. So I don't think it's basically what I'm saying is I don't think it's very credible. It doesn't mean that there won't be uh, attempts to to make it work because uh, the uh, the political uh, the political aspect is is dominating. I think what, one takeaway that you, is very important in this thing is that nuclear is a political business. It's not so much a technology. There are other technologies in the, among the renewables that can solve problems much more safely and better. And uh, but but nuclear is a political instrument. Even when you have drones. Yeah. Okay, there is about how many questions? Because I think we have one or two more questions. One here, last one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi, it's Thomas from Norway again. Um, I have. I just want to ask about this decentralized. Uh, I understand this as you as you went to more decentralized energy system. Uh, but in the case of renewables, wouldn't that be a bit problematic because of, again, because of the intermittency problem that it would be better to have a large grid that's interconnected in case, like, if the wind is blowing one place and not another place, uh, then energy would be transferred, uh, etc. Like, I don't know, I've, uh, I know, so energy economists believe that the integra in European integration... Uh, I, I missed the question. Oh, like... Um, isn't that more a decentralized energy system where, like, everyone has their own uh, solar no, system? No, no, I'm, no? Not, I'm, not, uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to sell decentralized systems. I, I okay. think we, we need systems in which we have a grid, mm -hmm. but the possibility exists, and, and it's trivial with, uh, really trivial, with uh, solar uh, to have an autonomous <coughs> house. Yeah. But you can do the same thing. You can have a grid for a, for a city. Mm -hmm. If the city is not too large, it's, it exists already. Mm -hmm. You already have groups of people in villages. I, I know that it's true in France. You have villages that are setting up their own little uh, grid. Uh, as long as you stay low energy, uh, low energy rate, uh, you, you, can, you can very well do it. So you mix that with a system in which you have a real national grid or international grid and you can, uh, you can send your electrons to, uh, to Poland or, to, uh, or get them from, uh, from Germany or whatever. You need both. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you.